Ah yes, the Nintendo Switch. This old girl might be the weakest system currently on the market, but damn does she backpack a punch. Rumor has it Nintendo are prepping the Switch's successor for a release in 2024, so let's take a look back at this unique console's incredibly strong run. Today we'll be covering a number of popular Switch games, including Super Mario 3D World, Mario Odyssey, Breath of the Wild, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, and even the latest Zelda title, Tears of the Kingdom. But let's start out with one of the games that made so many of us buy the console in the first place, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. If there's one game that Nintendo has supported post-release, it has to be Smash Ultimate. Introducing new stages, music, and fighters, the game expanded beyond what was already a roster of blockbuster gaming heroes, with the final character being none other other than Square Enix and Disney's love child, Sora of Kingdom Hearts fame. With the introduction of any new character into Smash, Kirby must also receive consideration as a result of his copy ability, being able to inhale and take on the abilities and appearance of his victims. While Kirby can copy Sora's powers, he will not be granted the ability to wield Sora's iconic weapon, the Keyblade. And the reason for this has actually been explained by director Masahiro Sakurai in the past. According to a tweet which has been translated by Push Dustin, Kirby is unable to attack using a Keyblade because of the Kingdom Hearts lore. Only a chosen Keyblade wielder can wield a Keyblade. Because a Keyblade has a mind of its own, it's able to refuse to be wielded by anyone other than its chosen bearer, or those who hold a close bond to their chosen. With this in mind, and contrary to this official explanation, data within the game suggests that this wasn't always the case, as an unused Keyblade model in the game's data can be found intended for Kirby's hand. Despite the 3D model existing, functionally, the Keyblade is unfinished. Even if modded into the game, the Keyblade will simply not spawn in. Disney's highly specific rules surrounding the Keyblade also altered the original plans for Sora's introduction into the Smash series, with Sora's original reveal trailer being set to play out somewhat differently. When making plans for the character's reveal, Sakurai had wanted the trailer to show Mario unlocking Sora's entry into the game by wielding the Keyblade himself. However, due to the specific guidelines that were provided by the team from Disney directly, this all had to change, because Mario is, surprisingly, not a Keyblade wielder within Kingdom Hearts lore. Speaking of Mario, as one of the most highly recognized characters in gaming history, Nintendo loves to sprinkle parts of his past into each new Mario title. This can be heard in Super Mario 3D World, where repeatedly hitting Bowser's broken car has a small chance of playing a randomly chosen sound effect from Super Mario World. There is a particularly small chance of a sound effect playing, with a 1 in 64 chance, and a pretty large number of possible sound effects, with 32 in total that can be played when one does, making it highly unlikely that any player has ever been able to hear them all. We mentioned before how the Switch isn't as strong a machine compared to its competitors' hardware, but this next tidbit demonstrates how that isn't such a big deal. Super Mario Odyssey is Mario's largest adventure yet, and being on Nintendo's latest hardware, one would expect an increase in graphic fidelity but in fact, the model used for the coins in-game is actually 65% simpler than those used in the earlier Super Mario Galaxy game released on the Wii. This is because the coins are able to be rendered in a much more visually appealing manner by taking advantage of modern rendering techniques, rather than simply introducing more polygons to make it smoother. Instead, by using a normal map, the manner in which light reflects on the object can be manipulated through using a rather simple texture image, instead of the more rendering intensive polygons being displayed on screen. Nintendo do love their rare chances of something being seen, perhaps they like the idea of kids telling their friends about something on the playground, only for every other kid to turn around and tell them they're full of it. Odyssey has a particularly strange occurrence that many have likely never seen. But before we jump into this rarely seen secret, a quick word from this episode's sponsor. Vitcha One XR Glasses. These lightweight gaming focus glasses are basically a private personal projector on your face. Only I can assure you, it's far more comfortable. And they're compatible with the Nintendo Switch and Steam Deck and all handheld gaming PCs like ROG Ally. Not only do the XR glasses adjust to fit the shape of your face, you can even adjust the focus of each eyepiece to match your prescription lenses. Each lens can output 1080p at 60 FPS and has adjustable brightness and opacity settings and has native 3D video and gaming support. The XR glasses also have great audio quality, which incredibly is also private thanks to their reverse sound field audio system developed in collaboration with Harman. The XR glasses can also connect to the Vitcho mobile dock, which provides up to six hours of extra playtime for the Switch or up to three hours for the Steam Deck. 
perfect for playing Tears of the Kingdom on long flights. It also lets players use two sets of glasses for multiplayer titles like Super Smash Bros or Mario Party. The XR glasses are $439 US dollars and the mobile dock is $129, but did you know gaming viewers can get them for less? You'll get a 10% discount off your entire order if you enter code DYKG at checkout. Just click the link at the top of the description or go to the URL on screen and grab a pair of XR glasses today. And now back to Mario. As I was saying, if Mario remains idle for a long period of time, he will, as is tradition, fall asleep. When sleeping in an area which has birds, typically most exterior locations in the game, one of the birds in the area will eventually fly over and land on Mario's nose. As most kingdoms in the game have their own regional bird variants, such as the Metro Kingdom housing pigeons, the bird which lands on Mario's nose will be native to the area he's sleeping in. However, there is also an extremely rare chance that instead of a native bird, a UFO will land on Mario's nose instead. A UFO which is actually found in the Moon Kingdom, which must be caught to get one of the region's power moons. With this in mind, the UFO will never land on Mario if he is sleeping in the Moon Kingdom itself, likely because doing so would result in a potentially simple manner of catching the UFO and completing the objective. These are some pretty cool details, but Mario Party Superstars actually has a rather uncool glitch that could leave players somewhat peeved. In early versions of the game, a rare glitch could occur while playing the Ice Rink Risk minigame, which could result in the minigame never coming to an end and the game essentially being softlocked. After all players were eliminated, the camera would fly upwards and show an infinite grey void, while only the sounds of the wind could be heard forever. This would of course be disappointing, but you might not be quite as let down as some diehard Mario Party fans when they felt they had been robbed of their beloved buttholes. The bobsled run minigame sees players riding a penguin sled in a race, having appeared in the earlier Mario Party 2, with the penguins the player rides having originally featured a small X in place of their butthole. Fans were disappointed to see that new versions of this beloved minigame removed this butthole. Although this may seem to be what's happened at first glance, the Mario Party Superstars version of this minigame is in fact based on the Mario Party 1 iteration, which used actual sleds in place of penguins. Thus, there is no butthole to be taken at all. Disheartening still, I'm sure, but not quite as much of a misgiving as some may have previously believed. Breath of the Wild has its own little secrets in regards to the monumental divine beasts. While these walking puzzles may have disappointed some fans of the franchise as they replaced the more traditional dungeons, this didn't stop them having some interesting unseen aspects. Each element of the new generation of Zelda games seems to have a deep level of consideration, and the music that plays while aboard these giants is no different. If the player listens closely, it's possible to hear a message in Morse code, specifically a message of SOS. with the possible reason being that it was part of the distress call from the champions sent out when they were attacked by the Blight of Ganon 100 years prior to the start of the game. Of course, the success of Breath of the Wild fueled hype for its sequel, originally dubbed rather succinctly as Sequel to Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Before Tears of the Kingdom released, a handful of fans pointed out that, based on the game's trailers, Tears of the Kingdom seemed to look a lot more like Breath of the Wild DLC than a full game in its own right. So it might be interesting for you to hear that Tears of the Kingdom was in fact initially conceived as a DLC installment for the original Breath of the Wild. However, producer IG Aonuma elected to bolster the project's concepts and transform it into a fully fledged follow up. This was in part due to the team having far too many ideas that they wanted to include, a goal that wasn't really possible to reach when using the existing base code for Breath of the Wild. Aonuma told Kotaku, when we released the DLC for Breath of the Wild, we realized that this was a great way to add more elements to the same world. But when it comes down to technical things, DLC is pretty much data you're adding to a pre-existing title. And so we wanted to add bigger changes. DLC is not enough, and that's why we thought maybe a sequel would be a good fit. At least the folks who thought Tears of the Kingdom would be no more than a full price cash in on something that could have just been DLC were pleasantly surprised when this game released. The dark and broody tones of Tears of the Kingdom were strong, just like in our next Switch exclusive game, Shin Mikami Tensei V. A statement released by character and demon designer Masayuki Doi reveals that Hayataro was originally created for the purpose of being the first demon that the player would encounter and recruit into their team, with the team even considering having the protagonist ride Hayataro as a sort of partner in crime relationship. 
but it was dropped as a result of technical circumstances. Doi also revealed in the same interview that Hayataro was selected for an untold purpose that was never realised in the game's final release. The only clue Doi gave to the demon's original use was that it would surprise many players if they were to hear it. Intriguing. Despite being inspired by both the Norse god of youth who shares the same name, as well as the folk tale of Little Red Riding Hood, the demon Idun was also inspired by an unlikely source, Japanese idols. Once again, Doi provided some insight into this, stating that this stemmed from, quote, the idea she'd likely be popular among all the gods who would woo her for her apples. Whether that innuendo was intentional or not, who knows. Doi also spoke about the design for the demon Kaya no Hime, and how it was a remix on an existing design from Shin Mikami Tensei 4. It's fair to say that there is a large volume of work on demons which have yet to be fully imagined, with Doi having stated, there are so many more design ideas and demons that we've stockpiled for potential using in the future, so if you ever get the chance, we'd love to bring them out. Speaking of demons, or monsters, it's time for some surprisingly interesting Pokemon Scarlet and Violet trivia. Toad School and Toad Scroll, divergent evolutions of Tentacool and Tentacruel, have some hidden secrets that could only be discovered through reverse engineering and some analysis. The names of these two Pokemon in the game's data are Okagingu and Okakiaradosu, which suggests that their lives began as something entirely different. Rather than referencing both Tentacool and Tentacruel, these names instead reference the names of Magikarp, known as Koi King in Japan, and its evolution, Gyarados. This would suggest that the games were originally going to feature divergent evolutions of the Magikarp variety instead of Tentacool. However, there is no other data relating to these scrap Pokemon versions besides their names. Flowers Blooms 15 on Twitter has pointed out, however, that there is a suspiciously off-looking Magikarp statue that can be found in Pokemon Legends Arceus, with them speculating this may be a possible look at the originally intended design of this new take on the infamously useless fish. With Arceus being developed at the same time as Scarlet and Violet, nothing much seems to stand in the way of this as a possible hypothesis. Now, at least for me, Magikarp invokes a deep-rooted fear, much like this Nets game the Resident Evil HD remaster. In the original release of this remaster, created as an exclusive for the GameCube, the MO Disc Reader was simply a GameCube console. However, for the HD remaster version of the game, the MO Disc Reader was altered again, as a result of it having been released on a multitude of platforms to be something slightly more generic as a means of avoiding having to use the console created by Nintendo, even in the Nintendo Switch version of the title. Another alteration was made to the game's final boss in this HD remaster release when Chris Red Field and Jill Valentine face up against the terror-inducing tyrant. After they unload a rocket right into the monster's face, the HD version introduces a rather more volatile explosion than its earlier release, now covering up what remains of the tyrant. A bit of a weird case of censorship, a bit less gore, but a more violent explosion. Paper Mario the Origami King is a name that, like Resident Evil, makes people cower in fear after continuing the trend of not really being all that much like a Paper Mario game. Putting that debate aside, we want to focus on a cool glitch pertaining to one of the game's out-of-bounds secrets. In the game, a piranha plant can be found in an inaccessible location, which leads to a very curious, if not slightly glitchy, battle. Starting a fight against this piranha plant will instead put the player up against four toads in an arena with a blue background and five rings where they would usually be four. This, of course, begs the question of why, but it leads us to explore an earlier discovery made in the first Paper Mario release on the Nintendo 64. Some unreachable enemies placed around the game's environment would default to a certain battle ID that would correspond with a fight against just a simple Goomba, likely put in place as a simple test fight. In Origami King, it seems that developers made a similar decision, and encountering an enemy without an assigned fight ID will default to this four-toed battle, which is almost certainly a test battle that was left on the disc. From one not-so-beloved game to one that has a particularly big fan. According to games journalist Dan Rickert, John Cena was actually a huge advocate for Samus' 2D return after Metroid Fusion. Allegedly, Cena would repeatedly express his desires for there to be a new 2D Metroid game to representatives at Nintendo during his advertising stint promoting the Switch. After the release of Metroid Dread, Nintendo sent Cena a copy of the game, to which his representatives responded with a message of his love for the game. This would explain Cena sharing a Samus Aran meme on his Instagram. 
Another interesting note is that while Metroid Samus Returns' initial code name was Matadora, the name for a killer who is a woman, Metroid Dread's internal code name was Kazadora, meaning Hunter who is a woman, both seemingly to reference Samus. But Dread's project name may have actually inspired an aspect of the final game that anyone can see. As pointed out by Mr. Cheese over on Twitter, my favourite Twitter handle by the way, the more prominent letters in Kazadora are Z, D and R, with ZDR being the planet that Metroid Dread takes place on. That's quite a sneaky easter egg. Or ZDR, you know? Now for everyone's favourite King of Swing, it's Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. On page 10 of Nintendo Power's 262nd issue in a feature titled The Score, the results of a large scale poll from the magazine's readers gives us some insights to their audience's opinions. One of the statistics shown is that Funky Kong was voted the most wanted Kong who wasn't playable in Donkey Kong Country Returns, even more so than Dixie Kong. This information could have possibly been taken on board by the game's developers at Retro, resulting in Funky Kong's inclusion as a playable character for the first time. Speaking of Funky Kong, when players exit the game shop as Funky, talk sometimes suggests that the player should give him the old banana slammer, dude. A reference to Donkey Kong's much loved catchphrase in the gigantic air quotes cult classic Donkey Kong Country animated series. Bananas! The game's homages aren't exclusive to previous Donkey Kong outings, as is seen in Windmill Hills, the first level of Autumn Heights. Former retro artist Eric Kozlovsky posted on his blog all the way back in 2014, revealing some perhaps overlooked references. I also came up with the look for the windmills and the Swiss chalet style houses. Initially, the interior of the giant windmill was going to be a bunch of smaller windmills, but I really wanted to do a DK take on the old Castlevania style clock tower levels. There are even subtle regional differences in Tropical Freeze's different releases. In the English script, the third boss level in which the player fights against Baboom is called Triple Trouble. But the Japanese game has a very different title, which makes a reference to the region. It's named Oenochi Chorai Baboon du Kataru, which means, your life please, we are baboons. Oenochi Chorai is said to have been exclaimed by samurai when they issued a challenge, literally meaning, your life please followed by their introduction of themselves in a formal manner, just like the level name. Did you also know that the 64DD expansion of Ocarina of Time, Ura Zelda, was also planned to include online play? Or that there's a cancelled Zelda 2 remake? For more facts, check out the video on screen, and we'll see you in the next time.